This is our Thought Leader Thursday webinar podcast series, and I have a really good friend of mine, and this is a special edition because um, we're talking about direct-to-consumer marketing and the evolving of a direct-to-consumer brand. This is Ian McLean. How are you doing, buddy? Good to see you, Ken. Good Thank to see you. you. for inviting me on, on the show. So, so Ian and I go back a ways. Yes. And um, Ian is a very, very talented director. Thank you. And I creative director and director. And um, we've worked with uh, at many, many occasions. Yep. So I wanted to talk about this subject today because as script to screen and M2 as direct consumer marketers... And that's how we've worked together. And, and Ian would would kind of he would lead our team when it came to direct to consumer marketing. So Ian has started a new company called Shy Girl, which is a cosmetics brand. And we were having a little conversation, and I was kind of I was watching him afar, and I was kind of pushing him in a little bit, like do some of this stuff, do some of this stuff on his social. And it was great because um, you were very open to it. Not to say that I have all the answers, but I think there were some, there were some epiphanies that yep. you had had. But what was really interesting about our conversation was about Shy Girl. So let's start from the beginning, and then I'm going to go back to when we talked a little over a week ago. Sure. But, so, Ian, t- first of all, for our audience, tell me a little bit about, a little bit about your background. Yep. What do you do? Campaigns you work on? Tell us about sure. yourself. Uh, I've came out of the mainstream advertising in the 90s. I worked for a number of small boutique agencies and then some big agencies, but mainly not on the big brands, but in retail. I worked a lot in retail, you know, selling, you know, whiteware, as we called it, pots and pans, Mm -hmm. anything from slippers, you know, pots and pans to lingerie Mm -hmm. to swimwear to kids stuff. So it was a real... Uh, collectively different types of products and it was all to do with going into mainstream retailers we had I worked on a, we had sort of three main retailers so I now, came is this, yeah. in a, this is in New Zealand yeah, yeah this is so in New Zealand so you can tell Ian's not from the Bronx no no <laughs> where are you from Auckland New Zealand okay so uh, you yeah. were working in the advertising yep. agencies in New Auckland New Zealand, New Zealand. yeah okay. that's where I got my start after art school I went into to that industry because it it was my second choice it wasn't my first choice but the first choice really didn't exist and that was fashion the fashion industry we didn't have one in New Zealand everything was imported from the United States the UK or the East okay in New Zealand brands there wasn't any because it was seemed to be like crap mm. we weren't sophisticated enough to have our own Mm-hmm. I always wanted to be a designer, a clothing designer. You know, I, there was something that I loved. Wow. You know? yeah. Interesting. So how did you get into really the creative part and the directing? When it comes to that? Um, I got into the creative and directing because when I was in the agency, uh, they went through a bit of a bumpy financial patch in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And so the owner of one particular agency said we're going to develop our own in-house production company because we had been you know like back then you would bring in a production company that was independent you would give them the scripts and all the work that you'd done on the campaign Mm -hmm. Um, because there used to be three of them there'd be the the radio campaign the television and then the print Mm -hmm. and that was for the launch of a a brand Mm -hmm. Um, and he came to us one day and he, he said we need to we need to learn how to make our own productions. And he was like, you want to direct, don't you, Ian? And I was like, uh, I talked about it. <laughs> I didn't put my hand up and say, hey, man, I want to be a movie director. <laughs> so it was sort of like, mm, okay. Trial by fire. Yeah. Bit, right? So I got into directing because we ended up building our own production company within the agency, and we there was two of us, and he was the lead creative director, and I was really only an art director, but we were both into directing. Got it. And so I learned that way. We taught each other how to direct by hiring the right DPs, right. the right crews, getting the right storyboard artists, working with the editors, uh-huh. and we'd always done that, but from a 
hands-off perspective. Right, because the production yeah. company was doing it. Okay. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, you're just sitting there at a monitor criticizing everything. <laughs> <laughs> thinking you're better <laughs> until you get in there and you go oh it's actually, hard <laughs> it's hard these guys actually do know what they're doing <laughs> yeah um and so that led me to winning a bunch of awards in sort of the late 90s early 2000s and i was kind of in this uh, in this kind of zone where it was going to be the year 2000 and i wanted to change my life because I'd never lived anywhere in the world. Auckland, I, you know, I lived there, grew up there, and I was just starting to see my life go into that. My parents are going to want me to get married, have kids, and I'm never going to see the world, you know, because it's, you know, you're going to be... So I went on... I decided... I quit my job at the agency, and I decided I'd go on a trip to New York to see my cousin... And my cousin was a um, Kiwi guy, and he worked for a company as a sales rep for directors and production for A and E. And I went there, and I took my showreel with me. Of, and I'd only directed by that stage, maybe I don't know, maybe two dozen jobs but they're all on film Mm -hmm. they're all constructed well they're all good brands and I had one really good brand which was Guess Lingerie which was an ad that was kind of you know based around Michael Bay the director in Hollywood right you know just and you know over the top it was over the top (laughs) yeah Yeah. it was very over the top very beautiful very glamorous and um, when I was there I went I went to see my cousin for couple of months because I was going to go to London and see some friends there from advertising and and um, I was there and I was staying with him and he took my reel and about four weeks later I was, you know I was trotting around New York doing all the touristy thing hey he goes hey you want to direct a job for us and I was like uh it, that's illegal isn't it I'm on a, I'm a tourist he goes nah don't worry about it we'll pay you under the table you know <laughs> Sorry, Uncle Sam. I'm legal now. <laughs> and so he got me this job for Liz Claiborne. They mm-hmm. saw this agency, big agency in New York had seen the reel because um, he had inroad connections. Sure. And they said, hey, is this guy here? And they went, yeah. He goes, bring him in. So I went into this huge agency and they were launching Curve Fragrances for Men and Women, Liz Claiborne. They had the, the agency. And I just kind of winged it with, you know, I knew what to say because all the creatives were there. Right, I knew right. all the buttons to press, and the, you know, <laughs> you know, and I dressed up like a director. <laughs> you know, I had my bingo hat on, and I was looking all cool. I had the accent, you know. <laughs> and um, they trotted me in, and lo and behold, they said, "Oh, you know," they gave me the script. They, you know, go away, do your treatment. I sent the treatment in with my cousin did. Lo and behold, bang you're on you got the job and I was like oh my god okay whoa whoa and it was like a $250,000 ad big deal man yeah on film 35 mil on a process trailer going around Manhattan and Times Square at night all dialogue within this car and man I was just like oh what have I done (laughs) What have I done, Ian? Oh, no, dude. You can't pull out of this now. And um, lo and behold, we, we, we shot the commercial and all around Times Square on a process trailer. It was kind of like a taxi's confession. Mm-hmm. And I remember we stopped on 45th and Broadway because we had trailers down this side to go. And I said, hey, look, I've got to go to the bathroom. But I went to the bathroom and vomited up, <laughs> Ken. Because I was sitting there with the executive sales president of Liz Claiborne, the agency executive, and I've got this microphone, and I'm speaking to the actors, which we had taken all the seats out. We had a steady cam in there, and the steady cam was moving between the actors as they were doing the dialogue, and I would be saying, nah, you know, and, and they'd re- I'd rehearse the actors. I put a lot into the pre-pro of it, you know, and I'd become so nervous on one of the rounds 
that I had to stop and I went and I vomited in the toilet and I was like going like this I was like I remember Ken I was like if they find out who I am I'm going to jail I'm going to go to jail you know they find I'm a fraud I'm on a you know a, 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 a tourist visa and because we had cops here and I'd never seen the cops like this in my life you know with horses and guns and they were <laughs> very nice and they were, they were our security you know and I was just like oh if they find out I'm done <laughs> I'm arrested you know going to jail in America so I was freaking out and so we did it and it was great and then I got another job straight from the agency for Excedrin headache tablets so when you start working with these big brands and Liz yep. Claiborne's and you get into fashion, right? Be- yep. And, and you have a passion for fashion Yeah, I did. Well. I had a big passion for it. So what brought you to L.A. and how, and how did your career go from that point on? And, and tell me why fashion was really your, your, I call it a bailiwick, the thing that just got your attention. Well, I didn't want to come to L.A. It was my ex-wife that brought me here. I had no intentions of coming to L.A. <laughs> None. Zero. It was okay to come out and do the theme park rides. That was great. <laughs> but I had no intentions of living here because New York, to me, New York was everything. I was working on clothing brands. I was working on gifts. I was working on Marby Jeans. I'd worked on Levi's. I was working with Liz Claiborne. I was working with Cover Girl, Maybelline. You know, like I worked on all the early test commercials for Adriana Lima. Yeah. Yeah. And that was cool when she had literally been discovered in in South America and been brought to the US to be the face of Maybelline and and to become a Victoria's Secrets model. I ended up coming to Los Angeles because my ex-wife got on a movie with a movie star and my ex-wife became her fashion stylist. And so we did a run of movies. She did a run of movies and it we were living by coastal by then, mm-hmm. and it was just. And then I got out to LA. I, I got introduced to you guys through my ex-wife. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, because I sent one of your executive creatives, one of your executives, my clunky website at the time. Mm-hmm. And he came in and he said, hey, do you want to do a job for us? And I'd never heard of direct response. You know, all I knew was these guys yelling at you on television, you know. <laughs> you know, set it and forget it. It slices and dates and cuts for aluminum can. And I was quite snobby because I had these big film brands, right? And I was big like... Fashion brands. Yeah, like I home to Nicole and I was like, I ain't doing that. <laughs> You know, that's crap, dude. Yeah. You know, and the people are really unattractive. <laughs> well, after work on America's Top, next yeah. top model, I get yeah, that. I, I was, that was the thing, kid, is. So I ended up, we ended up, because I said, okay, we'll, what we'll do, this was the plan. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be a dad. I wanted to have a kid. New York City, no way was I bringing a kid up in New York City. That was not going to be. We wanted to come to L.A. and have, because it was an easier flight home to New Zealand from L.A. From New York, it's 20 hours. It's a brutal trip. It's Mm -hmm. brutal. Um, And I didn't want to be doing that. So we kept our place in New York, and we made this our base. And I had an agent still in in New York, and I I was going back there a lot to, to do work right up until the credit crunch of 08, 09. Mm-hmm. You know, then it just, you know, as you know, it just, yeah, everything just whoosh. Yeah. Just, you know. So so we started working together, and then what's what's unique is that um, I think Ian has brought a lot of his, I mean, I'm talking, you know, top-tier fashion brands eye to what we've been doing in direct-to-consumer. And then, so from afar, I was looking at Ian, and he is la- thinking he's going to launch a cosmetic brand. Tell me where this idea of the cosmetic brand comes up, because yep. this is really interesting, because sure. he's going to do direct-to-consumer, and, yep. and script to screen is a direct-to-consumer agency, and so now you're going to be the person doing it yourself. Where yes. does this idea come from? Okay, the first thing, uh, <clears throat> um, I always had quite a... Uh, 
a love and a, and a lean towards the cosmetics. To me, it was it could change a person's whole look quite easily, and it was kind of like the transformation I saw from it was always this positive thing, and I liked it. And it was a simple kind of quite crude product. It's very simple and basic in its engineering and its dynamics. And I had a real sort of a, sort of a passion for cosmetics, and it was one of those things that was stuck in the back of my mind. And as the years would go, and I, I'd do more and more fashion jobs, I started getting upset on set with the f- makeup not being durable to the working conditions. You know, it's like, cut, next minute, in goes the makeup person. And then I'm like, can somebody get me something that we don't have to keep fixing it every five minutes because I'm cutting the camera, the crew loses their focus, now I've got to pull them all back in while you fluff around. And then sometimes you take them off set and take them back because, you know, it was getting that bad. Right. And five minutes turns into 20 minutes. Yeah, and exactly. Now as you know, Ken, burning. there's no yeah. such thing as, I'll be back in five minutes, I'll do it. No. <laughs> now you're into burn, the yeah. burn, and yeah. you feel it. You know, and what he what he talks about with burning means like every minute is money. Yeah, every and minute is money, and the producers you start seeing them getting wriggling around, and they're looking <laughs> at the monitor, and they're like, you can just see temperatures rising. <laughs> <laughs> and it's out of your control. And it's out of your control, and, but you're going to be taking it, right? As a director, it's part of your job. So you get in there, and you're like, hey man, what's going on? Okay, so you see this problem? Yeah, real problem. Okay, so why? So you decided that. I'm going to fix it. Well, yeah, I decided, I made the decision that because technology had allowed and come up in in 2015 when I did the big live, well, the, 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 the big content R&D with Facebook and Tourism New Zealand, and mm-hmm. I saw that we made these, you know, you saw them, those yep. little short films. Yeah. I mean, they did massive numbers right off the bat, 60 million, boom, like that. And this was their platform, Facebook's platform to start using that as an advertising platform, meaning this was affordable. And I was like, oh, this is good. I can make my own commercials, and I can run them on these platforms for virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm going to do what I've always wanted to do. I'm going to make my own cosmetic brand, and I'm going to fix the things that used to piss me off. And there was two things. One, the durability sucked. They just couldn't handle it. The the person would get too hot and the thing would run off and it was I was always the makeup would run yeah. and they wouldn't look yeah. beautiful yeah and it wouldn't be perfect right everything has to be perfect on camera if you're in like that man right and you got 4K you can't have a little bit of you know glugginess on, you know on your eyebrows or or on your eyelashes from a from a, a cosmetic that couldn't handle the heat and just started binding itself together. Because mm-hmm. it it, the, the fluid got sucked out of it, and now it just becomes a clump on your eye. And you're sitting in post-production, and that's all you can see. Yep. And you cannot get your mind off it. Right. <laughs> and that was the number one problem. Yep. What was the second problem? Second problem, every time I had an African-American or a dark-skinned Latino, the makeup artist didn't have a specific set of cosmetic tools for their skin tone and they would try mixing stuff up and doing stuff and then they'd present it and I'd go that looks awful (laughs) you gotta go back there and figure this out or else strip it down We'll we'll go natural I'll filter it, I'll light it just put the lightest stuff on her and I always found that the the makeup artists struggled with getting them where there was some kind of difference. Right. You know, they'd right. be in there for an hour and they'd come out and I'd go, what have you been doing? <laughs> There's no change. Yeah, from yeah. From when she went in. And that, and that was one of the things I just felt that they didn't understand their tone, their skin colour, that, you know, that they have way more red in their skin than we do. Mm-hmm. We have much more green as as white dudes, mm-hmm. you know, and white people. Um, so you've got to work on the, on the red and orange spheres. In in, 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 in in your color palette of your cosmetics. Right. And I think for most of the big brands, when I went and researched it, right. it was an 80 20. 80% for white people, 20% for those other people, black people, Latinos, darker skinned Asians. And that was it. They had a very narrow opportunity or very narrow. 
uh, band of what they could have that was specifically driven and made for them. Oh, so it was specifically made for them, but it wasn't like really technologically advanced and into the color palette. No, it was no. kind of like, well, we kind of have to do it. Right? Yeah, it, yeah, it was kind of a political. We have to kind of do it. There wasn't a lot of thought in it, and there mm-hmm. certainly wasn't a range because mm-hmm. you can go from, you know, if you go into Mac and and or you know Tate or whatever or Tart or whatever the big urban decay, they got that amount for all the white girls, and then that amount for all, all the ethnic, you know. They just didn't have a very big range of variety Mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And that was one thing I was like, hmm, we need more range. Right. These guys need their own specific brand and their own specific color palette. And I'll work with African-American girls and the development of Shy Girl. Mm -hmm. And, And we'll... I'll go after that market because that one over there is heavily saturated and don't have the sure. money to, sure. to compete. Now, Shy Girl is Ian's, him and his partner's brand. Yep. And why Shy Girl? Why do you call it Shy Girl? That's an interesting name. It's it, because working in advertising my whole life, it was a simple hook of a name. doesn't have some great depth to it. Mm-hmm. It's just people know Shy Girl. Just like Cover Girl. It, it was a very ah, easy, got it. singular yeah. name. Yeah. Shy Girl. That's it. So this is where it gets interesting because yeah. I see Ian do these beautiful pieces of content on Instagram. And I'm looking at this and I, and I and, and, and all due respect, I looked at it and I, I DM'd you and I said... Yeah, you did. I said, Ian, what is Shy Girl? Well, what does it stand for? I don't... I don't you're doing some beautiful stuff, but I don't get it. I don't understand it. And he said, that's interesting. Uh, let's talk about it. So we, we sat down and talked about it. And as a direct-to-consumer marketer, when people come to us, they one of the first things we ask is, why did you come up with this product? What's the story behind it? And who is the advocate to it? I, wanna, I, I, I always want to wrap a story around a product. Sure. And when I learned what Shy Girl, why it exists, yep. I said to you, why aren't you saying that, right? Yeah. And I, and I said to you, why, why aren't you saying that you had, you, you, you had this problem and you're going to fix this problem in the beauty category? So I, from my standpoint, I'm looking at it and going, oh, my gosh. If this product is good as Ian says it is, what a fantastic story to build around this. And when I challenge you with that, tell me tell me what kind of went on in your head. Uh, I was, you know, it was, I knew it had existed, but nobody had ever challenged me on it. You were the first person to say, whoa, that's, you know, that's where the idea came and, and you know, your the first in quote you know beauty director to come out with his own cosmetic brand yeah there's lots of makeup artists and other people but a director that's a different one in that but um and the category i picked and it was was you know for that ethnic market because i saw it wasn't getting the attention it right. needs right. right and um but i had internal issues about voicing my story and this is because it's not in me it was a political problem I had because here's a white middle class guy coming out with a brain for an African American culture and I felt that there would be backlash from it from both sides Mm -hmm. and I wanted to just be in the background Get an African American makeup artist and say, "Right, you're up front, dude." Right, and he's like, "Yeah, but I don't know anything of the story. I don't know. Like, don't, don't worry, I'll make it up." <laughs> and that's yeah. where, and yeah. that's what I, that's when I said, when you were, you had this internal, and I said, "Ian, what a great story! Here's a incredibly accomplished fashion director in the mecca of New York, Los Angeles, working." with Victoria's Secret models, beautiful women, America's Next Model, and, you're, and Top Model, and yep. you're in it, and 
And I said, and you experienced the problems of the director. What a great story where a director who is dealing with the most beautiful women in the world sees a problem and I'm going to solve it. And you didn't just say, oh, we're going to go buy something off the rack. You guys really do- – and you've been researching this. I've been, I've been knowing about it for at least three years, how yeah. far you've been re- researching yeah. it. And, and I want to get into that a yep. little bit. Sure. The point was is that as a direct-to-consumer brand, now he has a story that – he, as the direct, and I'm talking, he is though, though you're not yeah. here, but but Ian, as the as the international director for beautiful women, saw this problem, wanted to solve it, realized there wasn't an answer, and it should be coming from you, and that's when I pressed you, and you're like. And you really kind of got stopped in your tracks. It did stop me in my tracks. It did, Ken, because I had been internalizing it forever. But I had cooked up a a block, right, which actually didn't exist. And that, I think, was the shocking moment for me. I just had this kind of epiphany. I was like, wow, yeah, Ken is right. I think I've just turned it into something that it's actually not. Right, and I had been in the, you know, in, in off stage. I've been, right. you know, off the stage. Because I look at it and I go and I say, if here, here's a, here's a, th- talk about standing out as a direct to consumer brand. Like you said, there's no shy women anymore. No, <laughs> right? But yeah, but everybody's doing that. Yeah, everybody's doing that. And then all of a sudden, this director from New Zealand comes in and. It says, you know, I've done this and this and worked with these big brands and I saw this problem. Now you, what, what I look at as a direct-to-consumer marketer, which is your unique selling proposition. Correct, yep. Your unique selling proposition is I see this and I can solve this. And the beautiful thing was you, what I believe is now your your unique selling proposition as a storyteller, as the, as the developer, as the yep. founder, yep. that you can fix this problem. And then you went deeper. Tell me how, because when I say deeper, because you had to like formulate from scratch. From scratch, right? Because yeah. the, the compounds had to be different. Tell me yep. about, tell me about that Digging in and, and really going deep and okay, something yep. totally unique. Well, first off, you've got to you've got to get your guinea pigs, so to speak, to test on your girls. Okay, you've got to get them in, and you've got to get them part of the the overall um, creativity of the actual product itself. And I had this one lady who was part of Kevin Hart's group, mm-hmm. and she came and helped me. Uh, her name's Dominique, and she helped me develop, because she's a very beautiful African-American woman, she helped me develop the tonalities, which is real key. The rest is quite simple with the chemists, because um, mm-hmm. they have the formulas. And the one thing I wanted, though, is I wanted to make it vegan. I wanted to make it natural. I wanted to get rid of talc, get rid of parabens, get rid of all these nasty... And I wanted to make it in the United States. I didn't want to make it in China and ship it in or Thailand or wherever, all the other places they make it, the Philippines, Malaysia, Mexico. I want, no, this brand has to be built in America, you know. Why was that important to you? Because at the time when it first came up, you know, the political landscape was about bringing manufacturing back back into the U.S. And this is the one thing growing up as a kid. Everything that came from America was cool and it was great quality. And then as I was growing up in the 80s, we just got saturated in the garbage from China that didn't last, that looked crappy, it was cheap. And everyone, oh, but it's cheap. Yeah, but it's crap. There's no cool factor to it. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the, you know, that was a childhood thing, a teenage thing, is I wanted it to be cool American brand. Because to me... And it does exist completely and will always exist. America makes cool stuff. They are. They're the kings of cool. Mm -hmm. They make the coolest cars. They make the coolest movies. They make the coolest songs. Mm -hmm. They make the coolest fashion. You know, it's cool. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why I wanted it in America, because I want to be able to be proud and say, yeah, we're made right here in the USA, nowhere else. Everything comes from here, all the manufacturing, the builds here, the construction here, the printing of the, the, the product, the outer packaging. It's all here and made in the United States, you know. Um, and, yeah, it, it, it will cost a little bit more, but the, the branding imagery of it, mm-hmm. to me, has much more value later on than it is bringing in and and now look at the debacle of stuff coming in from china yeah. there's a wait list of six seven weeks to get your stuff i got friends who've got businesses that rely heavily on chinese imports then there was the tariffs didn't even affect me mm-hmm. i noticed that when the tariffs did come in that prices of vessels at like urban decay or smashbox they all inked up a few cents and dollars here and there mm-hmm. and then I discovered that they had been getting clubbed on the on the tariffs on the tariffs yeah, yeah. so so you've developed this line and yep. this woman helped you put it together and yep. so talk a little bit of if you were let's let's just go really crazy yep I'm an African American model I'm yep. a woman right yep. and I'm saying well we've got these other products and and we use them what do you say, what do you say to her? Does she does she understand the redness in her color of her skin, or how do you how yep. do you how do you communicate to your specific market where she's really going to understand? Well, one of the things I do when I present it to them, um, especially if we're doing a makeover on an African American girl and we're filming it, Mark, my makeup artist, will talk to her about the shading elements of the product for her and her skin. Some of them can be lighter, some of them can be darker. So you have to get a darker to go on to the darker to start getting some shape, start Ah. getting some contouring, start getting what the look they want. You just can't use the same shade. It's just going to disappear. You've got to have a heavier shade. So I've got in my product line, I go up in shades, one to seven. Mm. One being the lightest, seven being the darkest. Mm-hmm. You know, this is for very, very dark people, you mm-hmm. know. And um, one of those things is say, you, obviously, you've got to see it to believe it. So you've got to try it. Right. And then you'll start to see why that formula is working on your shade because it's a little darker. Mm-hmm. And when once you blend it in, you'll see what we're talking about, you know. And our... our um, Tinted moisturizer is very, you know, it's really developed good from that. And I get a lot of requests from African Americans. Women say, I love this. Can I have some more? Mm -hmm. Sure, you can, you know. Right. Um, Because we had looked at all the different skin tones, the darker skin tones, and made a a shade for them all. Mm -hmm. But you have to experiment with it first. We can show you. Yeah. But you need to experiment with it first. And then you'll find which one works for you the best. And then you've got. The feedback you got yep. from these models was what? Um, in the development? No, so, well, we the development now when you when your market yep. is using Shy Girl, what's the feedback you're getting to compared to what they've had? Well, I think they feel it's the tones correct. They don't have to mix it with anything. They like the natural feel of it. They like the durability because it lasts all day because it's made to be on a movie set, even though you're not on a movie set. They like mm-hmm. that. Um, they like the price point. Yeah. They do like the price point. Um, and they like the smell of it. Interesting. Yeah, because Shy Girl smells like brown sugar. Yeah. Was that on purpose? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And So how do you take... How do you take this epiphany of the conversation we had, and like you said, Mark, who is your uh, um, w- w- you know makeup artist, who's yep. obviously brilliant at what he does. He is very good. Yeah, but ha- and he just happens to be African American, but yep. he didn't have the story. So how do you how do you incorporate what we've talked about to? Create your niche in the direct to consumer because you are a direct to consumer brand, right? Correct. Yep. You're a direct to consumer brand. How do you now? How do you see that being part of your 
presentation to that specific market? And and I know you've only had a week to think about it. And what, how, you like the concept of you talking about yep. it and being that USP? Yeah, well, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> this if, is true. If, if I hadn't made the decision, okay, what I'm going to do, and I've been thinking about it because, you you know, I walked out of your office mm-hmm. and you planted a seed. Mm-hmm. And in, I just couldn't stop thinking about it for the whole week, and uh-huh. I've been discussing it with different people and this and Mark, and and I was like, okay, what we're going to do when I get back down to Houston, because I'm doing a, another big round of uh, makeovers with every single product I've got, so we're, we're going big this time. I'm going to make two other videos, one about Mark and one about Ian. And I'm going to have us combined, yeah. working together on what we're doing on set, why we're doing it this way, why would you know the 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 elements and the 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 um, uniqueness of Shy Girl, and I'm going to be working on camera with him to develop the look and the lighting and the makeup because I know a lot about it as well. And so, you can explain to your yeah. customer what's happening. Yeah, brilliant. So I love it. I'm going to. St- I love it. I'm going to. And start inserting myself into those videos with Mark. Mm-hmm. And yes, there'll be in the, in, in the new About page, mm-hmm. as I discussed with my partner, Julie, yeah. we'll do one on me. And, and he goes, yep, that's great. We'll do one on Mark. Mm-hmm. Just to sort of show our customers and our future customers that there, there is a trust here with these two yeah. men because they're working together to solve your problems, to make you beautiful, to make your day easier, to make you feel confident. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're working together yeah. on it. What I love about it is that, you know, we could, we could almost, you could, you, could, you could trick yourself into thinking, well, there has to be a woman that tells a story for a woman's product. And I say, no way. Because nobody knows fashion, what it means to be on set, yep. durability, color, than a director. And nobody knows it more than somebody who actually applies it, who has a, an amazing creative skill that can actually speak to your audience about why you need this. When that Message gets put together. I'm so excited for you because I think that women will understand. They go, "Oh my gosh, these these aren't just guys that decided to come up with a makeup. You had a problem to solve. You guys have very specific expertises, and yeah. when you come together, you've really created something that's unique and different. And I believe, as a direct to consumer brand, that is what is going to be the breakthrough for you and 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 I want to talk about that a little bit because as a direct to consumer agency and as we work together as yep. creative and director and yep. executive producer and things like that we look at a couple of things you know what is your unique, unique selling proposition yep. you have to figure that out so you can separate yourself from your competition in and his partner definitely have a um a unique selling proposition when it comes to the actual chemicals, but they have something layered on top of that from an expertise. So I would look at that and go, boom, got that, check. Right. You know, yep. What's the problem? Well, the problem, Ian has said, and what I'm doing now is I'm going through this checklist that we go through with our clients and what's the problem we're solving? Well, you, you've heard Ian say that, you know, women of color, didn't have this solution and it was causing him a problem and they didn't have a lot of options and no. he said I'm going to fix that the solution was you got the chemicals you knew exactly what you needed to do so there's the solution Your unique selling proposition is that you came up with it and then you're going to have testimonials from your the women right yep and yep. Yep. expertise validation which I think is Mark or other uh, makeup artists and then the demo. So what I've just gone through are the things that we look for in a direct-to-consumer campaign. You know, what's the hook? What's the USP? What's the problem? What's the solution? What's the what's the credibility? Or, and what's the testimonials? And the demo. Believe me, you've got the demo covered. You're a master about what you're going to do with these demos. So you are 
you've got the package, man. You have got right. the package. If you put all those together yep. and get it re- to your audience, she's going to realize it. And I think you're going to like, it's just going to go boom. Yeah, that's the big, you know, that's the, that's, you know, yeah, I've got the platform. It's now getting, because the one thing that, I've noticed I get a lot of traffic, but my conversion's mm-hmm. not where I want it to be. And it seems to be when I talk to marketers like you and other marketers that there is that pivotal the why, the why, yeah, the why, yeah. Why do these people want to convert and buy my product? Right. Yeah. Why do you exist? Yeah. Why? Why is what you're doing unique to solve their problem? And because you get the traffic, I think that's going to be if. If um, crafted correctly and often and at the top of it all and to get her, then she's going to go, oh, my goodness, this is something different. So I I believe that's really going to change your marketing and your success from from traffic to conversion. Because at the end of the day, it's about conversion. It is, yeah. About making money. And and I think that would – when you put that into your marketing – on Instagram and Facebook and because the stuff and we'll show some of the stuff in this in this um, interview it's beautiful it's beautiful but now there's a story behind it because now it's like okay why what's here why is it different and you've got my attention and now you've got that opportunity to tell that story and then when they get to the website you're just going to validate it again yeah so they know they're in the right spot yeah that, yeah, yeah. That that in essence is what we try to do in a direct to consumer campaign, and why I was so excited about talking through this with you because I could see it so clear, and you couldn't. No, no. It's the cobbler's new shoes in a way, isn't it? Eh? Yeah. And you couldn't see. Now I'm not saying I'm right, but I I have a really good feeling that. You're right, because QVC, when I told them the story, they went, bingo, yes, yeah, yeah, do you want to be on QVC? And I'm like, they're like, oh, they're excited. We've never had a fashion film director bring out his own cosmetic. Yes. That's a great yes. story, yes. Ian. So, you know, I'm in talks with them now. Yeah. My big concern with them, they have getting back to me this week, is yeah. my minimums, you know. Because sure. yeah. I might have to do another, you know, I might have to do a run because... Mm-hmm. I've got enough inventory, but yeah. I can't deplete it. Right. Because they would deplete Cause you gotta me. You've got the business to run. <laughs> yeah, but they could deplete me in, a, in two, two 10 minute slots. But the beauty of that, <laughs> Ian, is the fact that, you know, QVC is the ultimate in direct to consumer in a way because the real definition of direct to consumer is you serving your customer base, you owning their information so you can remarket to them. But from a QVC standpoint, they want to know the story. They need, once they understood the story, because things were kind of like, eh, nah, nah, and then you told them the story, and it's like, yes, yeah. we like it, right? Yeah, yeah. once I told them, the reps, the story, that's when they were got really excited. Yeah. Yeah, they got yeah. really excited about the, okay, well, we've got to get, you've got to come on and talk about this. And yes, we'll get Mark demoing it, but you've got to be, you know, which they loved, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but, yeah, you've got to come on and tell the story of Shy Girl. I would love to see you and Mark on QVC doing what you're going to do in your video. Yeah, like exactly. As a director, that's what I'm looking for. Hear Mark doing it. Look at that before and after. That would be... Do that as an ad. Would yeah, you I will. please do that yes, as an ad? Yes, I'm going to do that <laughs> next month. I'm going to. I'm scheduling a shoot down in Houston where awesome. Mark's based. Yeah. And Julian and myself are going to go down there for about four days to shoot. Uh, you know, we we got to shoot a lot of content. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to do that video of me and Mark. Yeah. And then I'm going to do some separate videos, all about Mark, all about Ian, and then the dual one between me and him working in combination. I can't wait till we have this conversation again in six months. Yeah. And to see what has happened, because I know you're going to execute. I know. Yeah. I know. Yep. Did you talk to your, we were talking about your digital agency. Yes. Did you talk to him a little bit about what we talked about yet, or has that not gone that, that far yet? 
No, I haven't talked to them yet about it. I'm okay. going to do that in person yeah, yeah, when yeah. I see them. It's yeah, yeah. it's not a conversation over the phone. It's, I understand. It's across the desk and why I'm doing it, you right. know. Um, right. So which I, I'm, I'm, I have no yeah issue with them. Yeah, no, 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 because we were talking about it and you were like, oh, because now they've got a real story to put together. You'll put together the content, but then they've got a story together when they start getting out and doing your ads and funnels and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so... I think in closing was that um, I could see all the, I could just see all the boxes that were, that were open. And then we talked about it with check, 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 (laughs) and they're all there and you didn't see it. And, and, and that's kind of how we, we build a direct to consumer campaign is to understand all these things and then weave it into a story for whether it's a mid form on television or short form or a long form or digital campaign or content or you know a website landing page that's all part of the direct to consumer campaign because you have to have the story mm. in every single platform so as he as he starts to implement this I think you're going to see a big, big, big difference. And and the wonderful thing for me was to see that you weren't at all backed off. You're like, oh, I can see it now. And I kudos to you for that, for just being open to that. Well, because- you gave me the permission to do it because I hadn't expressed it to very few people at all. Yeah. You, Carrie from QVC, and she'd only... When I told her the story, I don't. It was only prior a couple of days to when you know I mentioned you know when, when we talked about it. So it was sort of like I was getting you know because I was scared and I was worried on a political platform, yeah. which was just silly. Yeah. And you kind of gave me permission, Ken, because you know I've had a long, trustworthy uh, you know business relationship with you for many years. So it was sort of like you were like. Ian, what do you think, dude? <laughs> it's right here in your face. It's right there in your <laughs> face. What? <laughs> yeah, you know, it was like you slapped me yeah. back into it. Like yeah. you gave me permission. And yeah. I was like, yeah. Actually, that is a good story, but it's the honest story. This is how it came about. It didn't just... It's even, it's even more authentic yeah. and more... It's easier to, yeah. to say because that's what happened. Exactly. And that was me being frustrated as a director. Um and, and having because I you know I was constantly working with beautiful women and doing makeovers and makeups you know yeah. from all sorts of different walks of life and from the mum next door to the supermodel mm-hmm. they all want to look good and feel confident so you know we, we we would that was our job yeah it's what we do man you yeah. know we came along we make going to make you feel so important for a day you know when yeah. you come on set that everything's got to be be perfect why why can't you have that at home. No reason. No reason, man. And especially today, with all you guys on camera all the time, you kind of got to lift your game a little. <laughs> <laughs> Shy girl can help you. Yeah, 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 definitely. So t- tell me, tell me, um, um, for people who are interested in Shy Girl, how do they? How would they get a hold of this amazing product? How would where where is it? At? Uh, currently, uh, you can go on our website, which is www.shygirl.com. You'll see all the products there. Uh, you can buy whatever it is. We'll ship it to you immediately to your house. We will be in Amazon in two weeks, mm-hmm. um, but we're going to do a limited run into Amazon because that is a quite a uh, you know a competitive space. So we're mm-hmm. going to put our our um, top six sellers in there because right. I know most of you prefer the prime shipping mm-hmm. and I get that I mean I love Amazon for its shipping <laughs> yeah. you know it's yeah. no one can beat that company on its shipping front yeah. they nailed that man yeah. bingo <laughs> um, but you know um, if you want to you know direct to you know consumer or come to the website right. for sure um, we're working with going, we're working with some reps now to go into Alta because mm-hmm. Alt they feel that our brand is an indie brand that, and that's what Alta is. Mm-hmm. Alta is that's their space. You know, they're not Sephora or they're not trying to be the you know because Target and Sephora are battling each other now for that. You know, walk and have the 
beautiful cosmetic spaces, you know. Mm-hmm. That's going to, I mean, Target's putting a pretty b- decent effort in. I'll give mm-hmm. them that. Mm-hmm. But Ulta's more us because they're smaller. Um, they're kind of an indie brand. They're kind of cool. They've got their flagship Kylie in there now. And it's kind of, and I love the way she's growing her her direct yeah. consumer business you know mm-hmm. it's yeah it's, you know it, there's always you know they, there's always this the, 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 you know l, you know the, the lebron james right in every industry right you know right so how do uh so at shygirl.com shygirl.com and yep. if people were interested in like talking to you about it how would what's your email to get how do they, it's how right they... there. It says Shy Girl Support. If you need anything, if you want to talk okay. to us, if you want to leave a message, I am putting in actually this week a blog and a um, you know leave a comment, uh, uh, you know, or a review. Yep. On our on our web page. Yep. You know, on our website, the, yep. I'm going to do the review and 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 do the blog comments. Uh, if you want to do that. Um, and how about what's the Instagram for Shy Girl? Shy Girl Los Angeles is our okay. Instagram, and Shy Girl Los Angeles is our Facebook. Um, and then there's the Shy Girl YouTube channel, and we're just getting ready to develop the Shy Girl TikTok. Um, I'm just in working now in the TikTok with a, with a TikToker, yeah, who's coming on board to. You know what's do. exciting to me is that like we are talking about the groundswell right now. It's this is all this foundation, mm. and I, I can just. I can feel it in my bones how this is going to take off for you, and I'm really excited. The quality of what he's going to do is going to be amazing and blow everybody away. I mean, so I'll say it for you. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks. You know, Ian, I want to thank you very much for being part of this because, you know, being able to break down a brand and explaining how we go about it in direct to consumer and you being in the in at the the infancy of it and having an open mind and uh, I really really appreciate it because I uh, a I respect you as a peer and as a friend I just want to see you crush it thank you and, and thank you for having me on the show and yeah. being a, a good but tough client <laughs> Throughout the years, you got to have good, tough clients because yeah. they keep you in check. They yeah. push you, you know. Yeah. And uh, my experience with your digital agency has always been top notch, hundred percent. You know, high standards. You, there's no, you know, there's a high standard. You got to meet it. Yeah. You know, and that's is a good thing. You know, and yeah. it's been a great. You know, and thank you for supporting me, supporting Shy Girl, and my dream of, you know coming to America and having my own brand. You I know, love it. That's, that is just something that I've dreamt of since the day I got into advertising, you know. It's like, wow, imagine having your own brand. That must be cool. You're there. Yeah. Well, we're there. We're getting there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, it's definitely the world has allowed that through the technology and the platforms. Uh, I believe that the world has now allowed this but you didn't squash your dream and it's just no. persistence. Yeah, well, that's what it is. Eh? Thank you, Ken. Thank you, man. I Thank appreciate you. it.